Okay, so now let's carry all this a step further. You've probably watched a good many movies in your day. TV series. So you got a fair amount of stereotypes in your head. Stereotypes in the sense of, you know, public ideas of things. You know, the public idea of God, for example, is this dim distant, wimpy person who, in, when you're about ready to die or you get cancer or once on Sunday or at Easter or at Christmas, you, you, you think about for about five minutes. The common idea of a pastor is some guy with a collar who's really wimpy and is usually talking at a funeral. Or he talks like this and God is love and God wants you to be a good person and God helps those who help themselves. You know, totally false. Christ never talked like that. There's nobody in the Bible who's a Bible hero who talks like that. And nobody who actually lives and is mature talks like that. Only wimps and idiots talk like that. And yet, commonly, we hold up those people as being holy. See how weird this is? The images that we see on television are, they, are sold to us. But we also buy those images. That's why they're sold to us. There's way too much said about, oh, Satan's in the media and he's selling us a ball of wax. Yeah, of course he's in the media. He's in everything. Every thought you think has been influenced by satanic thinking. There's not a single thought you have, even when it's about the Bible, that isn't permeated with satanic thinking also. You live, eat, and breathe it from the moment you're born. It's his world. So now let's turn the tables on all that. We buy into those ideas because we like those ideas. So that's why people make movies on those ideas. That's why violence and sex are the main staple of every single movie. You have to have at least 15 minutes of sex and at least 15 minutes of violence in every hour or people are going to get bored because people want that stuff in what they see. To them, that's excitement. They won't admit it, but that's how it is. So it isn't simply what Satan sells. It's what we want to buy. So now we're going to turn the tables on all that. You've probably seen a whole lot of movies. And you probably have the common Sunday school ideas about the Bible. Oh, the parting of the Red Sea. Oh, Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. Oh, Gideon and the Fleece. Oh, David and Goliath. We've all heard those things since we were kids. And we can recite the facts. We have absolutely no idea what each of those stories represents. The real meaning of them. We have no clue. Okay, but we do have the stories in our heads. So how do you turn the tables? You're sitting right now somewhere listening to a voice. Somebody, this is a fact, not just a movie. Somebody who you can't see is watching you listen to this voice. Somebody's watching the voice making the recording. The first somebody is God, and there are three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. On top of them, or besides them, are a whole bunch of angels. They peek in on one person and the next person and the next person. Peter was talking about that. My pastor spent a lot of time. I'm not sure this is the right verse. Second Peter 2.21 or First Peter 2.21 just came into my mind. I'm laying on my stomach on some pillows. So I'm not looking at the computer. 
but the the, the operative term is um, long to look in translation, but in the Greek it's more like they're craning their necks in a stadium watching us. Okay, and then there are other verses like how the angels rejoice when somebody believes in Christ. In other words, honey, we're in a big political battle. And every single one of us is in a little stadium. So you're your own movie. You watch a movie with a bunch of actors. And they're trying to simulate real life, you know, according to stereotypes. But you are the real life. You really are the star of your own movie and you're being watched. The elect angels are watching and the demon boys are watching because all this stuff is a conflict between them playing out through a proxy, namely us. And the decisions we make determine how the conflict goes. That's the terms. So if you're learning something about Bible, the elect angels are cheering. And any demon boys in the vicinity, and you've got at least one guardian demon and one guardian angel. You know, and that's proverbial. That's also a stereotype, and it happens to be true. And the demons are cheering when you make a negative decision, and the angels are cheering when you make a positive decision. And my pastor liked to say that angels can't read our thoughts, but they have to, or it's not. There's a thing in legal terms called discovery, where all the information has to be equally available to both sides in a trial. So if angels are not innately capable of reading our thoughts, then there's some kind of divine broadcasting system making it available. Otherwise, there was no way to, to verify that our sins got paid for on the cross. Okay? Because Christ wasn't talking out loud about every sin that, got, that hit his brain. You get that. Okay, so every thought you think, everything you say, is being watched. You're still totally free and you're still totally protected according to the terms of the trial because the idea is your free will determines history. That's the whole theme of the Bible from Genesis forward, from the time of Genesis 3 forward. That's the way it goes. That's what we're here for. So instead of wigging out about it and looking around the room, just know how you're being watched. And I mean, you already know you're being watched by God. So why is it such a big deal if anybody else is watching too? You can't see God, but you know he's right there. He lives in you. So why wouldn't the angels be watching? They're getting full disclosure. They have to. This is a trial for their lives. And it couldn't be more political. So every movie you ever saw on television, whether it was an action movie or a drama or a comedy, honey, you're the star of all those kinds of movies and somebody's watching you be in it. Ed TV, that's you. That's me. When you go to the bathroom, you're on television, divine television. When you take a shower, you're on divine television. While you're sleeping, you're on divine television. And demons can send you thoughts. That's a, you know, pretty big doctrine in the Bible. And uh, my, my pastor liked to call it thought transference. So if they can send you thoughts, they can probably hear thoughts natively. Okay? But the point is, that you are not just Mr. Joe Blow from Schenectady, New York, who has his little travel bag and he's, he's a traveling salesman or whatever it is you do that you consider mundane or boring or stupid or meaningless. There's nothing about you that's meaningless. And God's hearing every thought that you think, and he's always heard every thought you think ever since eternity passed. It's all foreknown to him. That's why the, the, the demon boys and the angels got to get it too, so they can get the learning also. They're learning from us. That's what Peter was talking about when he says, angels long to look. In other words, there's stuff they don't know, even though they know the Bible better than any of us. There's a whole bunch of stuff they don't know that's playing out in our lives and they're learning too. And of course, this whole thing, I mean, this is a logical conclusion, you can test it, 
is obviously one great big evangelical pitch to the demon boys. Hi, you still got time to change your mind. Settle out of court before the judgment is rendered. Obviously, uh, 2 Peter uh, Peter 3.9, God is not willing, is never willing that anyone should perish. He's not willing the humans should perish. You think he wants the angels, the fallen angels, to go to hell? No, of course not. If he wanted that, it would have happened. So you're involved in a great big political game. Every decision you make, is it pro or con God? So see, now your life is not meaningless, and you're probably freaking out a little bit. I mean, you know, I don't know if you've ever given the serious thought, but it's an obvious conclusion. We know the angels are fighting. We got so many incorrect movies about these issues, about what the angels are doing and they're fighting. All those movies are, are um, incorrect, but the root ideas, a lot of the root ideas are correct. You know, it's unseen. They're fighting with each other. It's a proxy battle. They fight with the rule. They fight to control the rulers of the world. They fight to control politics. They fight to control business. We're all pawns. We're all, you know, puppets. Those of us who are, you know, believers in Christ, we can't be possessed, but we can be influenced. That's what happened to Judas. All right. They can enter into you. It doesn't mean that they can possess your body. That's a whole different story. That only happens to unbelievers. In other words, possession, the difference between possession and influence is that possession is, is, um, they can control your body. Control in the sense of, you know, make you do something that you wouldn't normally do. Like they made that guy among the tombs gash himself. He wouldn't have wanted to gash himself. You don't want to hurt yourself. You don't want to stab yourself. Okay. But influence is altogether different. Influence involves a cooperative effort. You want it. They make it feel good to you to have certain thoughts or desires. They send you thoughts and desires and feelings and you give in to them. That's the difference. That's why when someone says, oh, you know, thus and so is satanic, that's what it's referring to. The whole King James Only movement is totally satanic. The whole Islam is totally satanic. And they're dead giveaway signatures that they actually use to make sure everybody knows it's satanic. The stupidity of it is number one. Never makes any common sense. There's no common sense to sticking your butt up in the air five times a day. That does not come from God. So where does it come from? That everybody buys into it. The same thing is true with a lot of false doctrine in Christendom. I'm not trying to just single out the Muslims. Religion is insane. Completely and utterly insane. And people buy it year after year after year after year so coherently. See? See? So you're your own movie right now and everything you do, even when you're washing the dishes, is of political importance. You and me and everybody on this planet. And that's where the the, 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 the drama comes in. Because 90%, 99% really, of humans on this planet are, are thinking like Satan does. Because they've been so inculcated. We all have been from birth. And his system is do good, do good, do good, do good, be good, do good. Evaluate everybody based on what they do. Based on their works. Because he's that, that's, that's the herd. That's what he's hurting us. He's trying to beat God to the millennium. And when he can't do that, well, he gets us involved in gross sin. But gross sin is really not his goal. And you know that because all you have to do is look at Matthew 4. He was tempting Christ to do good deeds. He was not tempting him to grow sin. Good deeds are bigger sins. And subtle. Because it's like, well, the thing really is a good deed. It's really a good deed to feed people. 
yeah, okay, so speak these stones into bread. And if he doesn't do that, well, then he's not moral, is he? That was the first temptation. Second temptation, do something spectacular to show that you're the Christ. Jump from the temple, come to a safe landing. Yeah, well, Christians are always trying to do something flashy to get converts. We don't recognize that. We're always trying to feed the poor, feed the poor, feed the poor. As if, you know, just that was automatically okay, that there was no evil writing on it. Okay, and the third temptation, of course, was politics itself. Kill me, and then you save the world, and you have all these kingdoms, and you rule them. Uh, Christ was already the ruler of the world. He didn't, ha you know, he he's already entitled to it. But Satan won the control from Adam, so Satan was still the de facto. And Satan was trying to tempt Christ to kill Satan. In the third temptation, but it's political. Oh, you can have all the kingdoms of the world. What are Christians constantly fighting to do? Oh, we need to make ourselves a Christian nation. No, you don't. God never says that. Israel was a nation where people could vote with their feet to get learning about God. That's why the exodus occurred. That covenant lasted until Christ came and left the building. Because he won... A new covenant gets promulgated. That's the theme of the book of Hebrews. Which is building on what Paul had already started to explain in the book of Ephesians and Colossians. Due to, the con due to Christ winning at the cross, there's a new deal now. It's partly because the Jews rejected him, and it's also because he won, and because he's victorious, there has to be a kingdom to go with his battlefield royalty, which is Psalm 110. And there's not one theologian in a million who even understands what I just said. It's really pathetic. So that's the big deal in your daily life. Do you understand it? How well do you understand the Bible? How well are you trying to understand? Are you interested? Or is it more important to you what you're serving for dinner? I'm not saying that serving dinner has no importance. I'm not saying family has no importance. But you know what? There's a hierarchy of importance. And the whole goal is the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. All. Not 99%. 100. Well, you can't do that. Not unless the motive for everything you do is Him. So that's why I kept stressing in all those earlier episodes. When you're writing an email, you're washing the dishes, you're figuring out what to wear, ask God. Because that way you're looking at God's opinion first, and therefore everything you think and do gets in the habit of being God first. And chances are you're going to come to the same decisions anyhow. But the reasoning process... Especially if you're doing it every day, you get in the habit of doing it every day. The reasoning process is due to what God thinks. And honey, that's accomplishing Ed TV. God is hearing you think God is hearing you. You're saying, Oh, well, Dad, should I buy this jacket? And you're gonna fail all the time. It takes a long time to get into that habit of thinking. Because you're so, you're so inculcated with satanic thinking. We all are. We're little, stupid, weak humans. And everything, their future hangs on us. That's just got to chap them. If I, were, if I were a demon, I would really be p pissed off. So that's why they get, that's why we're so weak. So they get a level playing field. Okay, so they can't they can't say that, you know, they didn't have enough chance to influence us. And at the same time, the fact that we're small and weak is now suddenly not an issue. I hope you notice that. The only issue in our being small sorry about that. The only issue in our being small and weak is really kind of like, golly, we're so small and weak, why do we want God at all? 
It's amazing to the angels that we vote for God at all. It's amazing to the demons. And to them, the issue is, to the demons, well, see, God made you low and defective. So it's just like what you know Job's wife said to him, why don't you just curse God and die? God is unfair to you. That was his claim to the woman in the garden, too. Here you are, you're this little human. God's prohibiting you from something? And the classic modern-day speech that's equivalent is the, you know, the one at the end of um, Devil's Advocate starring Al Pacino, when Al Pacino gives his ending monologue, when God says, you know, why did God make it this way? He says, he gives you these things and, and you can look, but you can't touch. You can touch, but you can't eat. You know, that, that beautiful ending monologue, he did it so well. Because, you know, he's playing Satan there. The same mindset. In fact, Satan means attorney. You know, Al Pacino's playing the head attorney of a big New York law firm who tricks his own son into coming to work at that law firm. That's basically the story of that. It's a wonderful, wonderful movie. If you want to understand Satan's mindset, you really need to see that movie. So, that's you. You know, Keanu Reeves played the sun. That's you. That's me. That's each one of us. We are born in Satan's world. And we should be going along with Satan's deal. And he has every single possible handicap available to him. When a handicap is like handicap in golf, where you get... You know, extra credit, as it were. And it's really, it's, it's, you're, it's basically in golf, it's like you get an extra certain amount of strokes you can make that aren't going to count against your score. In golf, you want to have the lowest number of strokes from, from hole 1 to hole 18. And whoever has the lowest number of strokes that gets there wins. Okay, so if you have like a 30 handicap, a 50 handicap, a 150 handicap, that means you can make 150 more strokes to try to get the ball into the hole and it won't count against your score and you can still win. So Satan has this huge, as it were, golf handicap that God's giving him to, 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 to influence us and he does a real good job. So see, here you are. You're going to cook noodle dinner tonight. All right, now why did you pick noodles? Was it because of some doctrinal reason? See? Noodles for dinner. Okay, well, am I going to pick fettuccine or spaghetti? Well, why would you pick fettuccine over spaghetti? Was it based on some kind of intrinsic value in the fettuccine? Well, see, that that's good. That's a whole in one because the fettuccine is more nutritious. But did why did you care about it being nutritious? Well, because you got Bible doctrine going into you, and you need to stay healthy because the doctrine's inside your body, and you need your body so that you can stay alive to learn more doctrine. You see the point? Now, some people are just going to cook fettuccine because they like it. And it has nothing to do with God. God isn't even important to them. Well, then the fettuccine isn't important to him either. But if you're picking fettuccine because you want your nutrition to be better because you got Bible going into your head and you need your body to work better, and it's going to help accomplish that because it is rich in, in B vitamins for very few calories. Well, see, now all that reasoning is based on something that's related to God first. See the point? But you're just a human eating fettuccine. But it's not about fettuccine. You see that. So your little life, what color underwear you pick, whether you brush your teeth three times or two times or once, why did you pick brushing your teeth then? And they're watching all that. And it's like, oh, Brainot made a good decision based on God. Oh, Brainot screwed up there. 
I mean, I, I, I shudder to think at just what the audience might be. But I can't be worried about that. I can't wig out over this. God's hearing it. That's the thing i got to care about. So notice how the God priority starts to supersede everything else. It supersedes my sense of being inadequate. It supersedes my embarrassment at knowing I'm being watched. I mean, nobody wants to be watched when they're in the bathroom. Well, hey, you know what? You can't afford to worry about that. you got to get on with your life. God is seeing you do it. I'm sure you're somewhat comfortable with the idea that God's watching you all the time. In fact, you rely on it. Okay, so, well, it's not just God anymore. Could be some of your dead relatives, too, for all I know. Because if the angels are learning something by watching us, well, why wouldn't the dead humans in heaven be learning something? You see how far this goes? You're never your own. Any deed you do is never really you. It's always more important than you think. And the little tiny things that we are and the little tiny things that we do are being given this huge political value. And I got to tell you, I hate the fact that what I'm telling you is true. I hate it. I don't want, you know, beings I can't see are watching me. My big thought is, is golly, aren't they bored out of their minds? But you see, their whole their whole sense of who I am and what I am, meaning you and me, I'm using myself as a poster boy, is very different from my perception of myself. My perception of myself is I'm a nobody, I should be dead already, I should have never been born, nothing I do has any value. I mean, their perception is, why is Brain out interested in God, given what God's doing to her? They're asking the same question to you. I mean, you know, look at how weak and look at how much hassle everything is for us. Think like you're an angel. You've seen enough angel movies. You've seen enough devil movies. Pretend you're an angel and you're looking at the little humans. Doesn't it look like God gave us a bad deal? We have to eat. We have to pee. We have to breathe. Every little thing we do takes, you know, you have to put out, you know, a hundred times the effort to do the smallest thing. And then it never works. Or if it works, it works for only five minutes. You dust your computer. Five minutes later, there's new dust there. So do you dust anyway? Why? And most people, they just go on with their lives like sleepwalkers, like I said before. They just they, they got their little path, they had their thing they do at a certain time each day, and da 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 they're like ants in a trail. And, you know, God gets a nod on Sunday. Those aren't people that matter in the trial. They could matter but they don't. It's just like the Bible tells you. You've got all these running extras on the stage. This group fought that group. Well, you don't hear about all the individuals in the group. You only hear about the captain or the king or the prophet. You only hear about the head people. You don't hear about the extras. Okay, so do you want to be one of the extras? Or do you want to be one of the head people? Do you want to be a person who makes a difference? Or do you just want your tea and baguette? That's the decision you got to make. But you're on divine television. And that's the way this war is really fought. And if this war is fought in the head, learning and living on Bible, it buys time for all those who don't want to learn. For all those who are causing cursing by association, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, it helps reduce or stave off or reverse the judgment that war, you know, in human history represents. 
So you really are a soldier on the firing line. You're on divine television. And the war is in your head over your little life. Because it ain't little. It can't be little. If God's watching it, honey, ain't nothing little about your life even when you pee. Everything's about why did you make the decision you make? Did you do it well? Do you even understand? Do you want to understand? Do you want to know God? And once you get the answer that you wanted from God, it's going to be a shock. It always is. Every time, every answer, every doctrine from gospel forward is shocking and upsetting when you really think it through. So at first there's a whole lot you don't even understand or know. You chirp it, but you have no idea what those doctrines are. You just repeat them. You repeat the stories about Abraham and David and Gideon and Goliath. But you don't know what those stories mean. Okay, but someday you will. And when you do, it's just like you want to die. Because though it's little people, it's the individuals. Flawed individuals. Every single Bible hero is a flawed individual with a tragic flaw. Who just wants to know God. You can be one of them. So can I. You're watched to see if you're going to become one of them. And since by and large, you know, we aren't. Then it's like, oh, this movie's boring. Let's switch and change channels. Let's go find some believer who's actually interested in God. And so, you know, the audience who's watching is going from person to person to person to person. Looking in on, you know, person A. Oh, person A is busy playing with his rosary. Let's go somewhere else. Been there, done that. Oh, no, this person's actually learning something about how God orchestrates time. Which the scholars don't even know. That's that's a threat to the demon boys. Oh, this other person who has a problem applying a doctrine is gonna gonna go for it anyway, even though God's not treating that person too well. God get, lets us get hit with all kinds of stuff, and prosperity is just as bad as adversity because it's distracting. It begs the question. It puts our eyes on people and things rather than on God. But as you're thinking when you do your email or the dishes or you just inherited a million dollars or you just found out you got cancer, is your first thought about God? How do I line this up with the Bible? What does the Bible mean? Those are the few and they are the stars. If they keep it up. But even if they don't keep it up, that moment... About 1% of the people on this planet are actually interested to know God. Fleeting, childish, but they're interested. So that makes them special to start with. And then within that 1%, you know, there's a wide range of growth. And each one of us is growing or retrogressing at any given moment. See? Everything you see on TV is paradigmal. Even though the, you know, the, the facts, the so-called facts, or uh, you know, the, the presentations of the story is fictional or skewed. You know, everything that's related to faith and God and you know, the Bible is always wrong. But the essential idea is there is a such a thing as the forces of good and evil and you are the pawn in it that's in every single story and that's true so what decision do you want to make since you're the star of your own movie when you go to eat breakfast can't you turn that into a decision that teaches you more about God or that you get you, allows you to practice more about what you've learned about God and above all gets you trained in the habit of having a motive of well what does God think about this first then it's not about the thing you're doing with your body it's about what you're doing with your brain 
It's about where your motives are. It's about where your interest is. It's about what, you know, how much Bible you're learning and how well you're using it. And that's what's the exciting part of the movie to our unseen audience. Most exciting to God himself because it's a, a, you know, anything that's even remotely resembles the truth is more interesting to God than anything else. And it's very interesting to the rest of the audience. They're learning from us. Little puny us. From our breakfast. From whether I choose grape nuts or yogurt. Because it's not really about the grape nuts or the yogurt. It's about why I made that choice. You see? Now, I'm going to stop this because I think I've given you enough ideas to play with. And so now you can sit there and when you watch a movie on television, bear in mind that you're actually being watched watching that television for what you're going to do with the information that you're watching and whether you should be watching or not. Are you watching the right kind of program? Are you learning from God or about God through that program? And honey, you can learn about God through anything. Don't sit there and say, oh, well, I'm only going to watch TBN. Well, TBN is more apostate than the most so-called satanic program on television. You could be watching porn, and that would be less evil than watching TBN. Why? Because TBN's busy spreading false doctrine. You see the difference? Oh, this person's watching TBN because he thinks it makes himself a good Christian. And every single word that's said on that channel is going in one ear and out the other. And he's not learning a thing and the Bible's being spoken and he's not paying attention. That's very obviously a sin, isn't it? Okay, well, the Christian who backslides and watches two minutes of porn. I'm not sure how you can watch porn on TV, but I'm sure it's possible somehow. Well, at least he's being honest. He's not pretending to be holy. Surely you understand that pretending to be holy or telling yourself you're holy or getting you know, fed false doctrine is a greater sin than the Pharisees that were more condemned than the adulteress. Adultery is a sin like watching porn. I'm not really even sure that watching porn is a sin, but I can't see why anybody would want to do it. But you see the point? There are degrees. So Joe Blow believer and Jane Doe believer, one of them is watching porn and the other one is watching TBN and getting all, all you know, feelings of self-holiness. Who's going to be judged more? Who is committing the greater sin? And why couldn't you watch either thing? Oh, I can't imagine why anybody want to watch porn. But why couldn't you like turn either either event into an opportunity of of like intelligence gathering? Okay, God, what am I learning from this five minutes of TBN or porn? If you can stomach either one, I'm not sure. If I, had, if I was forced to choose between one or the other, I think I'd close my eyes and ears to both. But which would be the greater sin? Which can you not learn from? Well, you can learn from either one if you want. You can learn how stupid it is to watch somebody have sex on TV. I mean, that's a colossal waste of time. And you know what? The other thing that you learn from it is, oh, these poor people, this is what they think fun is? This is what they think pleasure is? They have no idea what's the pleasure of knowing God. They have no idea the higher enjoyments that come from living the spiritual life. So, of course, they're stuck with the animal grunting thing. And that's nothing at all like a husband and wife being totally in love with each other. It's a totally different ballgame. That's not, you know, there's nothing animalistic about a husband and wife having sex with each other. Nothing wrong with that at all. Okay, well, what's the difference? Well, porn is demeaning and boring. And so is TBN. 
That's basically having sex with false doctrine. So it's one kind of porn or another kind of porn. Take your pick. That's what I can learn from watching that stuff if I watched it. But I can't stomach watching either one. Well, but now you've got, that's the gamut, right? The the low end and high end of what's on TV. Okay, well then you got all that junk in the middle. What can you learn by watching it? Well, pretty much the same thing. People are all hung up on how they feel and their bodies, and they define things. They define happiness and meaning in life on some very shallow criteria for crying out loud. If this is what happiness is is in the human race, I don't want to be human. That's what you can learn. Okay, so now the demon boys or the angel boys watching you and hearing you learn are going to go, wow. A human being is actually learning Bible doctrine from watching television. Yeah, because you can learn Bible doctrine from doing anything. So they're learning, and that's a dramatic moment for them to watch us actually learn God from everything. And who do you think enjoys it the most? God. Because doesn't God have in his omniscience every single porn flick ever made? It's playing out for him for eternity past. Some porn flick that hasn't been made until two years from now has been playing in his head since eternity past. Not only the flicks, but everybody who's busy having sex. Every moment of every sexual encounter is playing life to him and has always played life to him. That's horrible, huh? Imagine having to be omniscient. Okay, so you're stuck. Not stuck. I mean, he chooses to keep knowing. But you got all that ugly knowledge in your head. 24-7, and then you got all these questions. Oh, Dad, I need a new... God, God please give me a million dollars. I need a new car. I need, I need this girlfriend to love me. I'll I'll say five Hail Marys if you if you give me that boy to to as my husband. I mean, you know, when we pray to God, our prayers are so shallow and petty, and we're so preoccupied with so many stupid things. And that's what he hears twenty four seven since eternity past. But here you come along, and you gotta write an email or wash a dish or stick something in the microwave. Or pull a Kleenex, and you're thinking something about the Bible related to that. You want to learn Bible on everything you are, or you're watching TV, and you want to learn, apply Bible to it. What am I learning, Dad? See how different your thoughts are from all the rest of it that's going on. How precious are those thoughts to God, and how influential are they in the trial? Just like God said to Satan about Job. Have you seen my servant Job? Have you seen my servant Braino? Have you seen my servant, that YouTuber who's listening to Braino talk right now? That servant was actually listening and wanting to learn some Bible stuff. And Braino's just helping to brainstorm. Braino's not a teacher. No woman is. But Brainout's learned a couple of things like of Bible, just like, you know what, some people have learned Windows better than I know. So if I hear them talk about Windows, I'll get the benefit of their knowledge. And it's still not teaching. They're just passing on what they learn. Okay, but there's somebody who's interested in learning things that are about God that are kind of, you know, take longer or harder to find. Brainstorming out issues. Well, that's got to be way more attractive than the bazillion years that God has already heard all those porn flicks. That God has seen all that sex that's gone on for who knows how long. All the murders, all the rapes, all the petty thoughts, all the religious people. How much more attractive is it to him? That you're trying to brainstorm a question about the Bible and how to think about God. 
How much more attractive is that versus the bulk of the human race? So why shouldn't God express his pleasure and say, you know what, Satan? This person's actually caring to listen and think about what I have to say in my word. And you know, I'm so pleased with that. I'm infinite. I need a really, 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 really big blessing to express my pleasure in that moment. Because I'm God and that moment's going to last forever. So you know what? I think I'm just going to bless all Houston. Well, well, but if he's blessing Houston, then any kind of war that's going to come is going to be staved off or be better prepared for. Right? Now, maybe you're living in Shanghai. Maybe you're living in, in, you know, Dort. Maybe you're living in Brussels or London or the Cotswolds. Maybe you're living in Mozambique. Okay, well, your country's getting benefit because of your interest in God. You're on TV, you're the star of the movie, and you're the action hero. It's political, it's an action hero movie, it's a drama, and honey, above all, it's a love story. See, all the elements of drama in order to get people who want to watch. Got to have a little sex, got to have a little violence. Okay, well, what's the sex? You're having intercourse with God. Intercourse fundamentally means a conversation between two persons, two or more. It doesn't get more intimate than Bible doctrine in your head and the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son living in you with the Holy Spirit making your body a temple. So it's justifiable that they live in you. It doesn't get more intimate than that. No sex can get that intimate. And he's expressing his pleasure there for Get it? So there's the love story. You and me, Christ in you, the confidence of glory. Christ's prayer in John 17, that we may be, that I may be in them as they are in me. That they be in us as we are in them. Oneness. Yeah, and that's a deliberate sexual analogy. Deliberate. To the end of uh, Genesis 2. We are the bride of Christ, okay? But it's better. It's not sex. It's better than sex. It's closer. Thought for thought melding. So it's a love story, honey. And therefore, there's a lot of violence. There's a whole lot of fighting that you're doing every single minute in your head. And you got a lot of people who are trying to kind of help you make the wrong decisions. People meaning angels the fallen kind, and people in your periphery being used as agents, and they won't know because they've already been inculcated with the doctrine, so they're naturally agents of Satan. They don't mean to be. They don't know they are. But we're all permeated with that nonsense. Okay, fine. We see that in the movies. We know how it plays. Okay, well, it is playing. So there's the violence. Sex and violence. It couldn't be more dramatic, and it couldn't be more political. So all those spy movies and all those intrigue movies and the drama and the crime and the who done it and the power games, honey, you're it. You got at least one demon who's assigned to you who's out to make you fail, to encourage you to fail, to help you fail. And then the other angel, the elect angel, is mostly just, just there to make sure that the, the demon doesn't go over the line. There are certain rules that they can follow, that they have to follow. They don't get to coerce you, for example. And he protects your life because there's a time and place for you to die. But most of the time, he's not doing anything. The actual direct inter in interaction is between God and you. And that's what the angels are learning. They're so watching us get that direct interaction from the Holy through the Holy Spirit. And when Father wants to say something, the Holy Spirit will transmit it. You'll know. And he transmits it through what? The Bible. Because it's its own mind, you know, its own pattern of thinking. 
And he sends you thoughts, he sends you Bible principles, he sends you snippets of verses, sometimes very many all at once. That you could, you know what it, what it is, you know, you understand it, but if you had to write out what you understand, it would take you days. And they're just totally, just in awestruck about that. This puny human understands this high doctrine that even angels don't understand as much as they'd like. See, it's a big drama to them. So, hopefully, I'm sorry this went to 50 minutes again. Hopefully you're now beginning to get a glimmer of how your life is really playing and your unseen audience and the fact that, you know what, you're on Divine TV whether you like it or not. And you're the star of the movie. And everybody who's in your periphery, the unseen audience in particular, is watching. Because they're as interested in you and what decisions you make and especially why you make them as you would be in your favorite movies that you sit down and watch yourself. So if you want to know what's really happening to you, well, it's the same thing as you sitting down and watching a movie you really want to see. Because they are interested. We're disinterested down here, and that's a big, you know, plot line in the movie. Our collective movie, so to speak. And whether it leads to war is based on that fact. When too much of the population is too disinterested, it's too contagious, and you know what? Got to clean house. And that's Leviticus 26 and 28 telling you how God cleans house in stages. So that's it. You're watching a movie, and you're all interested in the plot and the characters. Well, but you're a character, and they're interested in you. Now, the goal of this was to help you understand what's really going on, number one. And number two, to help you see that you are important. Don't regard yourself as unimportant and try to grapple, role play this out. Hi, when you're washing the dish, just remember, okay, I'm being watched. If you if you repeat that understanding, you won't wig out about it after a while. You just it's like, you know, you're aware of sounds and background noise. You're aware of this doctrine's always in the background of your understanding, and you need it to properly orient to the role you've got, and especially so that you'll re you'll get into the habit of whatever decision you got. What does God think about that? And you'll fail a lot. Don't worry about the failures. Just get up again. Use one John one nine. Get up again. And then you become just like the Bible heroes in the Bible who are flawed just like you are. There's nothing special about any of them. But there's something really special about what they learned about God while they were here. And the world was saved due to that. So it needs saving still. One moment at a time, one believer at a time, each of us star of our own movie. Because we're royal family of God. And you know how the royals are always watched. Peace out.